Hello and welcome to today's member exclusive webinar, How to Create Content That Converts, the first member exclusive webinar of 2020. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items just so you know how to get the most out of your participation today. The presentation will last for approximately 45 minutes. You'll be able to send text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat box of the control panel. You may send in these questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. Remember, you can send these in at any time. Whilst we don't send slides of the presentation today, this is for your use, the webinar will be available to watch on demand via our content hub exchange at exchange.cim.co.uk within the next couple of working days. I would now like to hand over to our content marketing course director, Chris Lee, who will be today's presenter. Over to you, Chris. Thanks so much, yeah, and welcome everyone. Um, so for the next 45 minutes, we're going to run through a bit of a taster of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, on the 12th of February in London, hopefully some of you will be joining us for the, the full event. Um, uh, those of you who can't, hopefully will, uh, will have whet your appetite. We've got some, another one in April as well, which we'll talk through at the end, no problem. Um, so 45 minutes and then we'll get 15 minutes for questions at the end, and we can always expand that depending on how much of a response we get. So in this webinar, what we're going to be covering is um, establishing your business objectives, um, looking at the content armory, seeing what's at your disposal. Think about things like tone of voice, which is really, really important because that really defines who you are as a business. And then I want to finish with uh, a little bit, of, uh, a bit of a hack really on, on how to write to the web and social media because <clears throat> there, is a, there is a skill to that. And, and uh, those brands that do it really well um, are... Uh, are going to are smashing it on social media and now the thing is though you can only really inform what how you write on social media if you've gone through the previous steps that we're just going to mention so on the on the day itself uh, we'll be looking at things uh, like amec which is the um, association for measurement and evaluation um, in communication they've got this brilliant setup in terms of how you can measure your paid earned shared owned media uh, as we use that and then by the end of the day the idea of the objective is to come out with a bit of a plan a skeleton plan of how you are either going to start your your content marketing if you haven't really you know got a structure in place or how you're going to edit it so it starts with an audit for example if you've already got a lot of content online so just moving on just a quick look at me um i've been in this industry 21 years and so work with a whole bunch of different firms including us agency side um lead for Philips Mail Grooming, uh, social and content years ago, worked with other brands such as Ubisoft, Elite Singles with Influencers, written for City AM, Computing Magazine, various others. And um, and I trained for um, a number of people including obviously CIM, uh, PRCA, Brighton SEO and uh, the uh, London College of Communications. So that's, um, that's, um, that's me in a nutshell. So uh, as, oh, as well as that, I should mention I run a, a football culture blog called Outside Right, that's W-R-I-T-E, so I'm on both sides of that influence offence, so I really understand the whole entire gambit. I work with PR agencies and marketers to um, help them establish what they want to achieve with content, uh, and so you'll find me two or three days a week in agencies at the coalface, and that's why I think it's really important for trainers to actually still be in the game and imparting the latest information, so that's why I'm running this event at CIM. Fantastic. So first up, let's think about establishing your business objectives. You've all got these in mind. The most important question in any business context, any kind of marketing is why? Why are we doing this? What, why would should people care what we're saying, et cetera? And that's where these people come in, the audience. They are the most important people in your industry, in your business. Without them, you don't exist. Same with any publisher online and we have to think of ourselves as publishers when it comes to the, uh, the internet because that is pretty much our shop window uh, for the rest of our business <clears throat> so the audience uh, if we can understand what drives them what they're interested in who they're listening to how they're sharing information this is really important um, to to teeing up our strategy and make sure that we're answering their questions and that comes down to everything from keyword research so understanding what they're searching for online and uh, also, when they're searching, when they're searching for our brand, what, what's the context around that as well? So there's various different things we need to understand about them, and how they like presenting it, and what technology they use. That's very important as well. 
because obviously, as you can imagine, a lot of people are using mobile devices. They may be using tablets as part of their research, and that's often a second screen. So we have to think about um, how we present uh, content that can be easily grazable, I guess. Um, uh, or And then we can look at more deep dive content like podcasts where you really get kind of 30 minutes um, dedicated time talking to someone. So it's a really um, interesting period to be going through, to be involved in, and everything's changing. Um, you know, so, so the key thing first then, audience. Start with them. Who is our audience? Where they live, what they look like, um, what, how old are they, all those important things. And what are their pain points? How can we help? How does our product or service help uh, them solve their everyday problems? They're bombarded by brands every day, hundreds of brands. Think about how many brands that you've come across today already. How many of them you actually got any kind of affinity for and how many are actually just a means to an end? So you may think about uh, a particular brand you buy because they're reliable, or you may actually really like a brand or, uh, or aspire to wear their clothes, drive their cars, et cetera. But there's very few that actually we have an emotional uh, um, affinity with. So we have to understand the context of our, how our product or service fits into their day. What interests them, of course, and how, therefore, can we create content that helps engage them? Because if they're going to be interested in that particular topic, then they're going to be more likely to convert and feel something for our brand. Who influences them? This is really important. When you think about the decision-making journey that we go on, we're going to have a look at that very shortly and one of the ways to model it anyway. Um, don't forget that people buy from people. So people are going to ask their friends what they think or their, their contacts online what for advice, et cetera, and where they should stay on holiday, where what they should buy in terms of accountancy software. It could be anything, really. So we need to understand who influences them, who are they listening to, and what are they searching for. So like I said, the one thing about Google search is what you understand the real mind of the individual, so what they're looking for. What they might ask you on social media, what they present about themselves in public is different from what they put on the search engine. It's not as curated. It's more honest and, and uh, actually truthful. So think of it like that. Second thing first, we know our audience. We have to think about linking back to our objectives. How can we get them to act? That's really important. What do we want them to do? There's nothing worse than sort of ambivalence, really. It's like you see a lot of content out there. It's just like a, a cul-de-sac, essentially. Essentially, it's a dead-end street where they tell you something and then that's it. Like, where do I go next? What should I do next? So we need a really clear call to action with any content we're putting out there. Also, why should they care about our content? Why is it relevant to them? That's where the whole research piece comes in, so that we know that we're resonating with them. We know that we're dealing with one of the pain points or a point of interest for them. And uh, also, because we've got someone who presents it really well, or can write really well, or speaks really well on a podcast, that they can actually engage with it. If you've got someone quite boring and monotone, it's not going to work the same way with writing. But bring it to life, um, especially with B2B, uh, B2C, sorry, B2C, business to consumer content. With B2B, you've got a little bit more um, freedom to be uh, matter of fact about things, uh, but with, with the consumer facing it's a very different voice. We're going to make sure we get it absolutely right. Um, how are we going to, this is another thing, how are we going to support our content on socials? It's not just about creating blog posts or videos or um, uh, podcasts even or infographics. How are we actually going to then convey them into a social environment and make them spread as far as possible? Do we need to incentivize people to take action with our content? Uh, if so, how? Click here, download this report get on our email list, et cetera, or give us permission to talk to you, of course, in the GDPR era. Um, and then, of course, how are we going to track and measure? And that's really important. So we're not tracking and measuring what we do. We don't know if we're being successful. That's why it goes back to right at the beginning. What does success look like? It's one of the things we're going to talk about in the training session itself. Uh, and then understanding how, therefore, we're going to, what we're going to measure and how. And that goes back to what I was talking about in terms of you know, uh, making sure that we know understand what success looks like so we can pivot our strategies accordingly so if we look at the the funnel this is pretty much it the sales funnel in terms of um the journey someone goes on from awareness of your product or service to completion they may have heard of your brand they may not know what you do um so content fits into that journey likewise so does social media so we have to think about the two prongs themselves uh, and awareness could come from anywhere from like, you know, PR pieces, opinion pieces, 
uh, and further down the funnel, people have read about you and said, okay, I've heard about these people, I want to learn, learn more. I've got, you know, I've got, I'm going back to accountancy software, and I say the reason I, I, I talk about that is because it's something that's close to yeah. something I've just been doing recently. So um, when I was buying one, I had to research and take some advice, um, and uh, I may have heard of someone from some PR they've done, an opinion piece. I may then watch a video, see how it works, read a blog post. And I'm getting further down that decision making journey. I'm getting to trust this company a little bit more, uh, or anyone else that I'm evaluating. And then, of course, in the consideration stage, you've got other things. I'm looking at case studies, for example. So everyone wants to see someone else up here, someone else in the same environment. So it could be an IT manager, it could be uh, another traveler, uh, backpacker, anything like that. It could be someone in your situation uh, that's just like you, going through the same thing that you're about to go through and you're researching it, and you want to see case studies of that particular situation working. Uh, so you may want to think about podcasts, more inspiration, learn a bit more about the company get to meet them in person. So things like video is really important at this point as well. Uh, and then you're sort of moving further on. An email newsletter used to be further um, to the left. Um, it's going further to the right now because obviously it's um, further down the funnel because you obviously have to give, give permission with GDPR to, um, to to sign up for these things. So um, you have to really be engaged with the, an organization to, to sign up for their email. So that's further down. So you become converted into the company and then you're going to uh, either buy the service or product or go on that trip, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and there you are, you have some loyalty towards the brands that, you're engaged, that you, you've bought from. The decision journey itself, though, is, is um, an interesting cycle. This is the McKinsey version of it, which some of you may have seen. It's always worth considering because it, it's all about identifying um, when opportunities arrive, the journey that someone goes through and whether or not they buy from you again. And that's the key thing, because the journey that when you bought from someone, the journey isn't over. You've got, to, you've got to get some repeat customers. So imagine I'm a hotel. So I'm going to Berlin. I have a budget in mind. I've got a location in mind. Uh, I've, you know, I put it out there, because obviously it's uh, social media, right? So everyone wants to say they're going on holiday and traveling. And I'll say, look, guys, I need some, some advice. Where's, you know, where's to stay, blah, blah, blah. And people give you their advice. And so therefore, you're going across this sort of research, consideration, evaluation stage. You've got a short list of maybe three to five places. Um, check out the website, check out their content. And then you buy, you have that experience. And hopefully, you become part of someone else's decision-making journey. This is where content is incredibly persuasive, not du just during the decision-making journey to conversion, but afterwards as well. So great, we've got a customer now. How do we keep them? And that's where the research and planning is really important. So if we look at the, the real, because it's obviously an iterative process, it goes uh, round, you never finish. You don't say, yeah, great, we're number one on Google. Or yeah, we're doing better than ever, right? We can sit on our laurels now, we can't do that. We have to actually make sure that we're continually improving, uh, seeing what's working, seeing what isn't, changing what is working, anticipating where new threats will come from. So you know, our competitor might stump up their SEO activity and knock us off number one on Google, that cost us X thousand. You visited every month, so you know we or Google can change its algorithm. So you've got to think about uh, all these different things. Um, so you start research and planning. As we'll go through this on the day. For those of you who are coming, we'll think about the audience. We're going to touch on that very shortly. In fact, here some of the uh, tactics we can go through. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then we'll talk about content and messaging because that's obviously informed by what we find out about the audience. Then we talk about things like culture and skills to make sure that we've got the right people to deliver that content. This is internal challenge. It's like, great, I need writers, I need videographers, I need graphic designers. Uh, this is what I need to put my team together. Uh, if I haven't got them in house, I need to find freelancers um, you know, that, that can help me out, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I, that's where I fit in often as a supplier. You know, I'm a content creator for, for various different organizations. Um, make sure we've got the right people help me deliver on, on what we want to achieve. Then next stage, we're putting that content out there. So that could be on uh, outreach through PR, we're pitching a new study into this, that, and the other, or we're trying to build links um, back to a website. Whatever our objective is, we'll make sure that our outreach uh, strategy matches those objectives. And then we'll analyze and check, see what worked, see what didn't, most importantly, learn from the failings, and we'll continually um, engage in this iterative process where we are um, continuing improving and assessing what we do and learning from it. Because new, new social channels, new um, content offerings, they'll come along all the time. We just need to understand where we fit into it and, and engage with those 
uh, new possibilities as they come. Uh, so, key thing first, thinking about our objectives again, what do we want to achieve? That could be anything from raising brand awareness, obviously a key driver for a lot of people, increasing search rankings. I know I've realized I've spoken quite a bit about search recently, but that is really important. Bear in mind that pretty much everyone starts some kind of search um, as part of some kind of Google search as uh, as part of their um, decision making journey. Um, is it to grow your social media community, in which case you have to make sure you've got the right people on your um, to manage your social communities? Is it to drive sales? Probably in every case it's to drive sales. It might be to inform opinion or change, uh, improve perception, change behavior, depending if, if you're a public sector body, for example. Um, if you're a non-governmental organization, it might be to uh, raise funds, et cetera. So you've all got these different objectives and we need to understand how content can help us achieve those, how understanding your audience can therefore inform the content we create, the messaging that we put out there as part of that and improve the chances of our content being effective. So there's, um, that's kind of the, the, the overview of part of the planning that we'll go through. As I mentioned on the day, we'll be articulating this a little bit more so that um, those in attendance will be able to sort of put together a bit of a skeleton plan. Now I want to sort of move on just now to, to looking at the type of content uh, formats that are, are open and available to us. So one of the um, one of the kind of oldest options, I suppose, uh, when it comes to internet publishing, is um, is it's obviously blog posts and, and, and written form content. If you think about what's good about long form hosted content, so that's content on your own site, that could be articles, blog posts, reports, etc. The benefits are it demonstrates thought leadership, it positions you as someone who knows what you're talking about helps persuade people a bit more that, um, who are going to buy from you potentially that you do know what you're talking about. It shows its cases to company and its people. Remember what I mentioned earlier with people buy from people. No one really wants to see an anonymous organization and see who's in charge, who they're going to be dealing with, you know, uh, who's the kind of expert in this particular area that um, they should hear about. And that feeds into your PR as well. That person should be promoted. Um, across various different channels as well as the expert, go-to expert. Um, of course, then it helps you perform on search engines as well because Google loves new content. And so that's really um, important part of uh, our content marketing is understanding uh, that it's going to help us appear in search and add value and power to our websites as well. When we talk about um, off-site uh, long-form text, we're talking about 400 words plus like um, content that's going to sit as a uh, LinkedIn Pulse, for example, is an example of here, uh, which is a LinkedIn's publishing suite. If you haven't used it, totally recommend it, um, either for you personally as per part of your personal online branding or for whichever company you represent. Um, also, uh, it's, it could be guest posts on, you know, well, any of the sort of leading publications in your sphere or somewhere like Medium, which is a blogging suite as well. A benefit again, you're talk, talking about thought leadership, but you're reaching different audience to the one that's that's already familiar with you because they're on your website. Again, it showcases companies, people to that new audience, um, but it opens access to those new relevant audiences and it drives inbound links, which is really important for, for search as well. So you're getting new traffic from new places um, and all the benefits that go with that. And also it's good for when people are just researching uh, if they keep finding you, they're going to think more highly of you as well. Video is, is the possibly, well, they say amongst the C-suite, one of the most um, impactful uh, ways of, of marketing because basically you're spoon feeding someone. And in the internet era, era, that's really important because, as I was mentioning earlier, a lot of people are just kind of like maybe scrolling through their mobile on their way to work or from work, um, second screening on a tablet. They don't really want to read things in depth, but it's nice to just do spoon fed something. And remember, again, we have an attention span then, so it could be, it should be less, you know, not a very long piece of content unless you're a real deep dive and you're expecting people to settle in for a certain amount of time. But for business, usually it's quite short. Uh, it's interactive. It showcases, again, the people and the products. I can't emphasize how important that is to see and hear the person that you're going to be buying from. Um, it tells a story. Or it should tell a story, I should say. There's nothing worse than a disjointed kind of video that doesn't start, finish, and end in the right way. So we'll be talking about how to put together a decent video as well. Uh, highly persuasive, of course, as I mentioned. Um, and again, 
uh, YouTube is, is the second leading search engine, really. Really good for things like how-to content. Um, if people want to be shown how to do something. So if your product or service helps someone in a practical manner, then you should be all over video. All right, so infographics, and some of you may have recreated created some of these already, um, but they are just a great way of summarizing really important information in a succinct, user-friendly way. So the great thing about this is they're, again, interactive. Um, they're embeddable, so people, you know, if you source them to uh, out to media, then they can put them in, and media loves it because as long as they're not too heavily branded because uh, they're always on the pressure to get new content. So if they can get as much uh, from, from you know, PR people and content creators as possible to put on their site and then add some context around that that gives them something interactive as well. Access link bait in terms of people, you know, linking to you going, oh gosh, have you seen this? It's amazing. Um, again, they can be newsworthy as long as they're topical. They can really bring, sort of, say, a, a report or something like that to life. Uh, and it tells that story really quickly. I've used these before. They're really, they're not expensive to put together. There are, we're going to look at uh, programs that you can create them free. Obviously, when you're doing that, it's not as intuitive. It takes a little bit of um, creative mindset, uh, visually creative mindset, I should say. Um, but usually you'd outsource this to a, a designer, and it wouldn't be, you know, too long. And one of the, one of the dangers with creating infographic, though, is uh, that the potential is there for a graphic designer to kind of show off. So you want to make sure that you tell the story succinctly and actually add value rather than confuse people. So I've seen some really confusing infographics in my time. I'm sure you have as well. So keep it simple. Podcasts, one of my favorite formats. I've probably alluded to this already. I've been podcasting for more than 10 years myself in various different guides. Uh, guides is now it seems to be the very thing and everyone, everyone seems to have one. But uh, why they're so important is obviously they're very portable. We all got um, lots of space on our mobile phones now um, to, to play MP3s such as podcasts. Um, and the, the really important thing is extremely personal. So when you're uh, out running, you can listen to a podcast. Uh, you couldn't watch YouTube and go running. You could try, probably end up in a tree or uh, something tripping over, but you can't do that at the same time. You can't go driving. And, uh, and check out infographics. But what you can do is you can do other things and have a podcast going on all the time. It's a highly portable format. The great thing as well is that they are very intimate. So you've got a dialogue going on between two people, for example, one host, one guest, if they've got really good voice, um, then you can, you've got that time with people to express uh, what we were talking about before, positioning yourself as a thought leader, giving them useful advice, all the stuff that you've, you've you've accrued through your planning stage really they obviously they can be very impactful um and that's that's i think an area still to be exploited fully by brands i think a lot of our web publishers are doing very well on them the great thing they're also measurable uh and they're great content to share as well but you have to understand the context people might not listen to them you know in real time so i think they might download listen to later in their own time so um you have to sort of understand you're playing the long game with podcasts when you're building up an audience, etc. All right, so that's uh, the content format open to our disposal. Now I want to sort of think about um, when we're planning that content itself, how are we going to make sure that we're sounding uh, the way we should uh, to our different audiences? So what we're going to do in the training session is look at personas and how we understand who our audience is, how we can segment them, and then the different language we're going to, type, uh, to use uh, to approach each one, and also um, the type of, not just content, but the tone of voice as well. The tone of voice is really important because that embodies your brand and your personality, the values, it defines who you are and your relationship with the, the audience. Uh, it really builds trust and it's unique to you, but it's got to be consistent. So uh, if I think of, think of brands like, um, uh, Brewdog, for example, which is a brewer, some of you might be familiar with. They've always been kind of had this rebellious tone of voice, was doing like stunts, etc. And their tone of voice hasn't even changed, even as they've got more successful. So you know exactly what you're going to get with that particular brand. I'm sure we could all think of other brands. It's just one example. Um, so when we're looking at personas, we'll be running an exercise on the day where I get everyone to think about who they are 
and if they've done persona work already, it'd be super easy. And if they haven't, uh, it'll force them to think a bit more about who their audience is, which is great. Um, so we want to answer, you know, who are these people? Where do they work? Um, what they do for a living, I guess. Um, what interests them? Are they into sports? Are they into science? Are they into history documentaries? What are they into? And then we think about um, <clears throat> how they interact online, uh, who, what social channels they're on, and then, of course, what they read, what, which news sites uh, are they interested in uh, mostly, what magazines, etc. So that way we get build up a full picture of who they are, and then we can inform and use the right kind of language to them. What's not too confusing, uh, it's not too highbrow, <clears throat> it's not too lowbrow. Either. So we're going to look at some tools, some free tools on the day as well, to write great headlines and to understand what level our content is aimed at from an educational level, uh, an age level, etc., things like that. So that, if we think about tone of voice, then we then look into the brand and going, okay, what's the character and persona of your brand? Uh, what's the tone, again, tone of voice, which we've done in the previous slide, what language are you using? Um, technical, uh, mainstream, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then obviously, what's your brand purpose? You'll hear the word brand purpose quite a lot uh, this year, because, you know, especially with topics such as environment, plastic, uh, recycling, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of emphasis on these things at the minute, so we have to think about what our brand purpose is. So we've got to think about the content of our purpose and content of our brand, we're going to look through that as we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once the time, we've got 15 minutes uh, of, kind of presentation time left, which is great, because it gives us enough time to think about writing for the web. Now, some of you might be um, publishers already of content. I imagine you are. Maybe you've got your own blog. Um, maybe you like writing articles. Um, news sites, whatever it happens to be. There is an art to it, there's a skill to it. And the um, key thing to remember is, again, going back to the audience, how are they consuming this information, what interests them, et cetera. So once you've done this research, of course, you can then set about following um, various different rules, to make sure that we are being as impactful as possible with our content. So if we look at some basic sort of rule setting here, blog posts, let's have a look at the data then, see how people read online. And if you look at the data, you can find that only 16% of people actually read word by word from the screen. Eight and 10, pretty much, are always scanning a new page. So context setting, if we put out a wall of words uh, on our, from our blog posts, whatever it happens to be, no one's gonna read it, they're gonna find it really difficult, they're gonna be put off straight away. So we need to break this up, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm gonna go through some great examples on the day of brands that have collared this, got publishing really well, so magazine style with uh, bullet points, with subheads, with nice pictures, interactive, uh, um, you know, things you can play with. So we'll break it up and make sure that we, we're publishing. So it's, um, if the title really matters, we're going to look at some techniques into writing really great headlines. We're going to experiment. We're going to use an online tool that helps you write better, um, uh, better, uh, headlines. Um, bear in mind that 18, 10 people read that only the headline and nothing else. That makes means that the, the um, headline is really, really important. Uh, they may well get the message they need from the headline, in which case, great. But really, we want to get that message up front and make sure that we um, increase the chance of sharing it. Because you can see, 6 in 10 people share the com online content without actually reading it. So, I mean, I, maybe some of us have been there where you've, you've tracked some content with a bit.ly, you know, the, the the link shortener where you can see how many people clicked on it. You'll find you've got more retweets than actual clicks, which is kind of weird because you thought people should be reading this. Anyway, there we are. So this does happen. Um, we're gonna increase the chances of our conversion. That's what we really wanna do. And traffic can vary by up to 500% according to the type of headline. So very, very important that we get this right. So what should structure look like? So I put this together here and we're gonna experiment with this on the day. Um, but you can see it starts with a really impactful headline. So this article will change your life. You won't believe, you know, these 10 top whatever, it's number seven will blow your mind. You've probably seen them all. We're going to go through those in a minute, uh, a bit more about headlines. But the headline is really important. It's going to be compelling, drive clicks, and make sure it that the content that follows it delivers on that. Otherwise, it's just clickbait. 
uh, and people will feel cheated. So you've got to make sure you deliver on the title if you're going to be impactful. Bear in mind, this has got a lot more freedom with uh, business to consumer, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to um, the uh, type of headlines you can write with, with business to business. Obviously, you've got a brand to reflect, and it's going to have to be a little bit more um, matter of fact, I guess, but still get the message across in a mature way. Uh, then you've got the sub, the stand fast, we call it. This, the um, stand first is a very important uh, paragraph. To sum everything up, but at the same time, not to the point where people feel they don't need to read on anymore. I've read everything, I've got the title and the thing, and okay, I get the principle, I'm off. You want to give them enough and tempt them in to read further on. And going back, the next bit is the meat of the content here. This is where it's really important to um, understand. Uh, that people are consuming probably from mobile. You could go into your Google Analytics, for example, uh, which is another thing we're going to be doing on the day, by the way, Google Analytics. Um, but if you look into Google Analytics, you can see what devices people are using for um, when they access your website. For, for my blog, it gets anywhere between seven and 10,000 hits a month. I know that 60% of them are accessing it from a mobile. So that means that they're going to be spending less time short screen, probably grazing, and they need a lot of subtitles, subheads, bullets, photos, things that can distract them, and they're very light on detail, unless they're going to really deep dive, and in which case, that links back to how I promote it on social. But you can see here in the main bit here, the big chunk, this is all about using images, infographics, um, breaking it up with what we call H2 subheads, and they're great for search as well. And on the day, I'll talk about how that's helped me rank number one on Google for a uh, couple of my blog posts. And then we've got to finish with a call to action. You know, like I said at the beginning, it's not about a cul-de-sac or a dead end street. We've got to then we've got them. You know, it's very difficult to earn that person's click and their trust. And we've got them to reach the end. Right, what do we want them to do? We put calls to action throughout the content of course, and that often helps. Um, you should always have links to other articles that they can read. Uh, but also think about, you know, content uh, some call to action, often without a pop-up. If you can resist a pop-up, fantastic. They're not very popular at all. So headline. There's a sort of um, formula that one should always follow, which is ADA. So it's all about attention, interest, desire, and action. So first up, again, you've got very few words to get this, remember. Get the audience's attention. You know, hey, scream. Um, draw them in. We've got some examples coming up. Um, desire, get some desire going. So it's like, okay, what have they got? What am I going to read, and why should I read on? Uh, and then obviously the call to action. You've got to think about what you're going to do at the end of it. So what works really well? Let's have a look. Here we are. What works? So make a promise. Think about what's in it for the reader. Trigger that curiosity. So uh, we've got one here. This organizer might just organism that might so save the planet. Oh, what could it be? Use numbers if relevant. Mon numbers really work. We'll have a look at some headlines in a moment. Uh, as to, you know how much they, they tend to make up of different um, uh, different types of headlines. Uh, ask a question. That's always good. And that makes people feel go involved, engaged, and obviously with social media as well. It's really important because then people can actually reply to you. And then, of course, you have to respond to that either with just a like uh, to acknowledge that you've read it. Otherwise, people feel ignored and it's a bit, they have to do it again. Use impactful language, but um, not too shocking, I hope. Depends who you are again. Keep it brief. That's the most important thing. Just keep it to the point. You'll find some publications um, that write really, really long ones, uh, and that may be uh, an SEO tactic or just to have style. But anyway, with headlines, though, key things get emotional. There's a uh, a, um, there's a psychologist called Robert Flutchick who said there was eight kind of key emotions that people would go through um, that would inspire an action. Now, the key thing with with any of your content is you do not want to, uh, <laughs> I guess the word is, you don't want to kind of bore people, I say. That ambivalence is the, is the enemy of creativity, as they like to say. So there's the kind of eight emotions that one should Kind of try and aim for them, and on those that attend the actual session will get a uh, will receive a content template from me 
which help you plan for these sort of things. And one of the columns in it is emotional. So what, what, what are you trying to instill in people? And that helps you focus, it helps the writer focus or the videographer, whoever it is um, that's creating that content to sort of focus on that, creating that experience. Now, if you're an NGO, for example, you're Greenpeace, you want to talk about, you know, maybe anger and disgust, a uh, bit of fear about the state of the planet. If you are a charity, you want to instill joy, you know, that your donation is really making a difference, etc. Um, so think about the emotions that your audience really want. And it does come back to them because there's different types uh, of audience. So there's, uh, according to some psychologists, again, there's, there's, there's open consciousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. We've all got these in different kind of grades, I guess. And one of the um, if you think about, say, energetic extroversion here, need stimulation, you can see that in someone like Red Bull. It's always like really sort of high octane activities, people jumping off buildings with those sort of jetpack things. Um, you know, so they're going for that sort of thing. Whereas someone like um, Patagonia, which is maybe more of the out, great outdoors, then you think about like intellectual curiosity and adventure. You know, so there's, if you understand your audience is made up of different types of people, then you can serve all of these audiences around the same topic, but in a different sort of manner. So let's look at those headlines again. So like I said, we'll be do, using a headline writing tool when we get there, but we can see here that numbers feature in the, just over a third of headlines. Uh, one that talks to the reader directly, as in the second person, you can do this, you can do that, you should do this. Uh, that's just one in five, 21%. 17% are just kind of like how-to content. 15% kind of um, has nothing particular about it and then 11% asks a question. We want to make sure we mix those up. You might see that some uh, you know, mashables of this world and um, BuzzFeeds, they often do 17 ways you can do this, number 10 will blow your mind. Uh, you don't want to do listicles all the time. Listicles are, are good in context, um, but um, you know, they're, that's, different. that's okay for them because they're kind of like a news site, but if you're a brand, you want to sort of mix up these kind of type of content and headlines. So a little bit of best practice on copy because I'm conscious of time. Um, a great headline ad analyzes coach schedule. I really like using that. Um, have a play around with it. Um, basically, what it does is tells gives you a score. And we're going to play around with that on the day. Use a one paragraph head, head um, intro, stand fast, it covers everything. Break up content regularly with bullets and subheads. That's really important in the era of mobile and tablet consumption. Uh, for blogs, I think other tools you can use like highlighting quotes and other stats. So with LinkedIn Pulse, for example, and on WordPress and I'm sure other publishing uh, CMS uh, content management systems, you can actually create a pullout where you can do a set standalone kind of quote box and then you get a message across really clearly and it's, it looks more like sort of magazine style. You use amazing visuals and preferably with people's faces on it. People's, there's numerous studies that show uh, that people are more responsive to um, people who are kind of like them. You know, if you have just buildings, uh, say if you're trying to promote um, a particular Madrid, for example, there you are, you can have a nice picture of the Ibelez Palace with the fountain. Um, but if you've got people in it, in the same location, enjoying it and having fun, then you kind of, you know, help that individual see themselves there, you know, and understand that the, the potential of visiting that particular part of the world could happen then. So, the other thing we're going to cover in um, content is obviously you've written the content, great, written some great blog posts, written a great report, uh, we've made a great video. How are we going to promote on social media? Because obviously every brand has social channels, depending you know, which one depends very much on uh, what type of organization you are and where your audience is active, most importantly. So with social media, uh, tweets with images, for example, and videos, they gain most attention. Um, very really important to use hashtags, but within um, within reason. So Instagram, I think we've got up to 28, for example, but with tweets, you don't use more than probably one or two. So they've got to be relevant, make sure they're not linked to someone else uh, or associated with another brand or event. Um, and, you know, they're third, a third more likely to be retweeted than those without. People are following these sort of various different topics. And think about marketing in the moment as well with Twitter. Think about what's um, without kind of uh, yes, promoting something that's inappropriate for the context of the news agenda, but think about how you can sort of do something that's timely. 
Uh, in 13 URL in the middle of the tweet, increases engagement by 26%. So think about how you can structure your tweet so that the link is right in the middle. Um, maybe that means finishing with a following statement, for example, at the end, or maybe it's a few hashtags at the bottom. Keep them short. Um, ask questions always, of course. Uh, and maybe a couple of polls. You know, keep people engaged, keep them interested. And then don't forget that, some, um, that yes, maybe you can post things once on Facebook, Instagram, etc., LinkedIn, but things like Twitter, which is far more um, turnover, I guess, more real time. You can you can share content more than once. So experiment with the headline, see what works, see what doesn't. Uh, more importantly, so uh, example here is like some great headlines are these are various formulas that seem to work. The secret of X, what you need to know about X, certain ways to do number seven, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do, number seven is incredible. Um, and that just gets, piques people's curiosity. You've seen that tactic so often as a way of getting people in. And you may have failed for it yourself. It's like, oh, great, you know what? Uh, if you read one thing today, make sure it's on how to do something. Um, what do you think about? And then, of course, the other thing about, especially with B2B, it's absolutely essential. Use emojis. They're very you know, playful, for want of a better word. Um, people love them. Uh, and even within business to business now, as long as you're using the right ones and they're relevant to what you're doing they can really bring a tweet to life and, and statistically they do actually improve the chances of a um of conversion of people actually converting so just quickly on timing then we'll also talk about when it's a good time to do these things uh, this activity so linkedin if you're on a company page it could be once or twice but a day monday to friday most activities midweek if you look at your google analytics for your company and you run a b2b company uh, you'll probably find that people, it's like the Loch Ness Monster, it goes up and down, up and down, and it's down during Saturday, Sunday, and then go a little bit up on Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's a big hump, and then goes down on Friday again, because people aren't really thinking about work. So think about that most people are most active and receptive to things on Tuesday through Thursday. So Monday, they're probably just you know getting into the week, Friday, they're kind of winding down. So think about you know the context of your audience, where they're at when you're doing this activity. Uh, Twitter, four to six, uh, post uh, during the week. Um, if you think it's worth doing on the weekend, if your your data suggests uh, that it's a good thing, we'll be looking at these analytics tools to find out uh, on during the training. Then yeah, fantastic. Facebook again, work out what time your audience is active. Um, YouTube, if you can do one or two a month, fantastic. Things with videos and podcasting is once you've started, you have to think about making it episodic or at least in a series. So that people expect consistency, that uh, they subscribe for a reason. They'll unsubscribe if they're not getting what they want, what they need. Instagram once or twice a day. Um, research suggests that around midday lunchtime and also in the evening, local time is the most impactful. And then if you're posting on something like Medium or LinkedIn Pulse, we try and get once a month. So uh, we are training. Uh, that would have been perfect timing had I not um, got kicked off my mobile network just then. So. Uh, <laughs> Apologies for that. We're a little bit delayed, but um, not by much. Here we go. When are we training? Wednesday, 12th of February um, and Tuesday, 28th of April. So you can find out more details there. And if I hand back to the um, guys to do a bit of a wrap up in terms of, um, uh, we've got a few more things to say about the course before we open up the questions. We do. Thank you very much, Chris, for the illuminating presentation. Um, I'm not too proud to say I'll be using some of the insights in my own role this afternoon. It'll make me look a lot better, so thank you for that. Um, I do apologize for the technical issues we had during the presentation, but it looks like we have quite a few questions and some pretty tough ones, Chris, I'll be honest. So, um, uh -oh. I know, it's gonna, I'll start you with an easy one, though. Um, I'd like to say we're now going to answer the questions that have been submitted. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the attendee control panel. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Our first question, and I told you I'll give you an easy one because it does get harder. A couple of people asking about the acronym ICYMI. Can you just tell us what it stands for, please, Chris? Uh, in, oh, sorry, yeah, maybe I didn't say it. In, in case you missed it. Ah. Um, and that you'll see that quite a lot. Um, and it basically means you're acknowledging you've posted this already once, um, but you're doing it again. So it's like, in case you missed it, <clears throat> excuse me, first time. We often find with content when you post it first time, this is why it's really important. Um, it will register with your audience and they may or may not click. And if they see it again, uh, the same thing, it's almost like they, if they didn't engage with it the first time, they might not next time. So first time is very important um, to make that really important first impression. Unless an influencer gives it a new impetus, it's very unlikely that you're going to get as much traction as you did the first time around. 
Um, so when you do, in case you missed it, it just goes to acknowledge that you've done this before, um, but you're just, you know, you're not trying not to be boring, but you're, you know, or, or too pushy, but here's a new angle, you know. Oh, cool. So it's a sort Sorry, of second I chance. No, that's yeah. all right. Maybe you have, but a few people have asked. So just a second chance to make a good first impression, I suppose. Um, I did say they will. They do get harder, and I'm going to have to mention oh. GDPR here. Um, with GDPR, oh, wow. a couple of people have mentioned that they're more limited in their analytics, uh, for instance, with, with cookies and Google yeah. Analytics for the demographic section. How do they get more insights into their audience whilst respecting what are very strict GDPR requirements? Right. Well, I'm, here's the thing. I'm not. I've written probably about hundred thousand plus words on on GDPR during the last two or three years, um, and it still kind of confuses me as much as probably anyone else. Um, but yeah, I mean, people can opt out, obviously, from cookies, etc. Well, well, when you go um, and various tracking, sorry, uh, elements. Um, I think it's. I I often just go with what I can and. Uh, either assume that we can magnify those numbers, so to speak, for each demographic according to how many there are. Um, it may be that certain some demographics, especially younger people who are more savvy about the internet um, and know how to sort of manage their um, presences a lot more, will opt out of being tracked. Um, and I think that's something that may become more of a thing because we're getting all these sort of uh, trust issues thrown at us from all angles uh, and especially I mean I don't know if you guys did this but I, I got my uh, Facebook tra you know who's track who's tracking me or feeding information to Facebook from you know third party sites um, and I was like oh gosh I didn't realize that you know there's so many sites are doing it and obviously somewhere in the small print it says we'll be you know feeding this information to third parties and you may just accept and move on uh, and you visit all these sites to do it so um, I not probably the, the person to ask answer that question. I don't want to sort of sell myself uh, short in that regard. But I also wouldn't want to give misadvise anyone. Um, GDPR, I think, is something that we're all going to learn more about as we go. Um, but demographically, I think that's to work with what we have and what we know already from uh, other sources, so to speak, other than just say Google Analytics. Definitely tread carefully. I think we all have to with yeah. GDPR. Um, in that sort of zone, um, and what you were talking about earlier of in case you missed it, um, there's certainly yeah. been some debate on in the questions about sharing the same written content on a number of platforms, on the company right. blog, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Do you believe Google penalizes the least credible site? Uh, as it, as uh, it well, might be plagiarizing. Thing. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. The I wouldn't recommend putting exactly the same content out uh, say exactly copy so imagine you did a blog post on your website and then you copied and pasted the exact same thing in LinkedIn Pulse and then on Medium. I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um because like you said it does look Google will be going, hang on, I've read this before somewhere. Um and uh if it's gonna be similar, they have a thing called canonicals um on web publishing where you can if you're writing something similar you can designate which which one is the sort of the one that uh um Google should read and that you're kind of acknowledging that it's similar stroke same content but the uh, that's on your own site I I would just basically just treat each platform individually each content should be unique so if you're writing about the same topic um, then just write different angles different types of arrangement of wordings um, etc on that same topic mix up the order of the tips whatever it happens to be change them around change the wording and then you know, then you can hit multiple sources with effectively the same message, but with different different content. You do not want to do exactly the same copy and paste job. No, absolutely not. Perfect. In on that note, and a few people have asked, is there such a thing as evergreen content, stuff that just yeah. simply won't be pushed down the search return? Um, evergreen content is very valuable, and the only thing is, there's different types of content. We go into this on the day. There's stuff that's around timeliness. Say, so like, oh, we want to talk about, you know. Uh, Canada is a place to live on the back of like Harry and Meghan moving to Canada, for example, then that's timely and of, of now. So you could have a hit around writing about moving to Canada and what lifestyle in Canada is like. Um, but also that could have evergreen potential because if you're writing top tips of moving to Canada, um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, I've got no interest, um, like personal in, in, you know, interest in this, in, in the topic. So the way that you present things 
uh, is very important. If you think about the long game, uh, either you're cashing in on a particular news agenda, but it's got longer legs than that for a long time, then yes, definitely do. Now, what, as you know, uh, I run a, I mentioned, alluded to earlier, I've got a, a blog called Outside Right, W-R-I-T-E. And I, my biggest driver of traffic is a blog post I wrote three years ago. And the reason it's still my biggest driver of traffic because it sat on Google for that long. Um, above articles by The Guardian, above articles um, from other kind of more impactful sites than mine, uh, or have a stronger domain authority. And the reason it's number one is partly because of the way that uh, Google rewards what we call snippets. So it looks at things like H2 header, headers that I like mentioned. I've got, um, uh, I have these head, subheads that you put in things. And I made a listicle with these H2 as, as each head. And Google, because of the way it's organizing things on search, just pulled that um, content together and um, attributed sort of badges to it at one point. So it's in effectively position zero. And it's a lot more arty than it is. If you Google left wing football clubs, you'll probably see it. Uh, and see my article, and th th that's just fascinating. You know, I had no intention of doing that. I had no idea. I was just presenting it as, as I thought. And then the, the way Google changed things um, pushed it up to number one. It's getting loads of attention, lots of shares, etc. It's getting shared a thousand times a night at one point on a, a, a forum. And so, yeah, there is such a thing as evergreen content. Um, key thing is as we'll cover in the course as well, is that you visit your content and do regular audits to see what if whether your content is performing well, uh, it's still relevant to make sure that you know it's up to date and people are finding it. They're not finding in misinformation or information that's out of date. It's got to be relevant still. So yeah, I mean there is such a thing as evergreen. Yeah, I'm sure. It's evergreen, but you do have to keep on top of it. I'd also recommend anyone to check out Chris's blog outside right if you're a football or non-football fan. Uh, just another little plug for you there. Um, a lot of people going on about the BT, B2C and B2B sort of different. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll go on the B2C issue first. How do you measure improved perception or a set reputation in a B2C environment where maybe the audiences mm. are more diverse and massive than yeah. in the B2B? You know what? That's quite, that can be quite difficult and that can often relate. There's, there's desktop research you can do such as um, you know, Google Trends and see what um, different kind of people are searching for your brand, for example, alongside other, um, say, scandal words. Say if you've been involved in a scandal and you see whether or not there's attention still on that particular topic. Um, but there's also, I guess, things like running regular um, forums and focus groups with your audience to, uh, and surveys. You know, there are fairly, fairly cost-effective uh, online survey um, companies out there without naming any um, that you can keep tabs on how people feel about your brand um, and that's that's probably one of the best ways to, um, to understand how they feel about you and what you offer and whether or not they understand um, what you offer and it's worth good practice to do anyway you have so often to understand uh, if people have a complete conception of what you actually offer and if they haven't, that's a great example. That, that informs your content strategy because, you know, you, right, we need to educate people. We sell this particular type of insurance. And they had no idea we did life insurance. We need to, you know, we need to sort of get this messaging across. And content probably a good or if not the best way of doing that. Yeah. Um, that's headline. Eight out of ten read only the headline. Uh, mm. Is that B2C? Do you think it's a similar stat oh. for B2B audiences? Uh, B2B audience is probably different. I think that's more B2C where you've got less time to impress. I think B2B, when you go on to, say, a telecoms industry website or, uh, you know, a legal um, industry website, then I think you're going to be in a different mindset than if you're looking for, say, entertainment or just, you know, browsing. So you've gone with a specific region, but, region, but yes, you still have to get that um, that message across, really. So it is very important, but that headline has to match your tone of voice, which is why we're doing tone of voice before we do headlines. Excellent. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I shall sneak a few in if that's all right with you, Chris. Yeah. Um, a lot of people asking how many personas is usually good to define. Is it a case that they have one main one and a few complementary, or is that too simple? Uh, I'm going to do the whole sit on the fence thing. So it depends because obviously every brand is different. If your main audience is, say, IT managers, I've spent a lot of my career writing for IT managers, um, then I kind of, they have quite similar kind of objectives. Um, 
in terms of, and also uh, it, there's probably more information around what we can find about them. But if you're you're a uh, store and you're selling uh, children's clothes and adults' clothes and food as well, then you've got lots of different types of personas coming into your store for different reasons. So it's a question of um, dividing those up in, in accordingly and making sure that you're tailoring to not just age group. I don't want to sort of like stereotype here, but what I would say is that don't think about too much about um, age, but think about more about interest because you could be interested in um, a particular topic at, at any age. Um, you know, just a question of um, getting people where they're interested rather than just about, you know, things such as, as age or uh, gender and things like that. So you can be a little bit more specialised these days with, with how you target people uh, yeah. rather than age and race, religion, more about what they're interested in as a whole group. Yeah, I think that, that I mean, I'd, yeah, yeah, I think, I think we've probably got that right. A lot of people are asking, um, what your, well, one, are there any equally impactful content forms that can be used aside from video, infographics, podcasts? A lot of people are asking what your favourite one is, actually, so maybe... Maybe you can answer that. Um, and about infographics as a whole, are they more of a B2B uh, thing, or do you think they can work in both B2C and B2B? They, work in, they can work in both, and the thing is it depends. I mean, at the end of the day, the story is the, is the key thing, um, and how you tell that in infographic form. So if you've got something for aim of consumers and you want them to take an action, want to educate them about how to do things, so you step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, infographics, perfect. Um, uh, yeah, I can see why they, that people might think it's probably more useful for B2B, B2 B, but I think uh, I wouldn't want to be limited by saying that um, either is either more important or more valid because at the end of the day, it's the story that matters and what you're trying to convey. Um, and you want to talk about what, what uh, infographics in general, I think we've kind of I'd say peaked, but people are very interested in two or three years ago. Now people are very interested in podcasts, which I'm delighted to hear as a podcast myself. But at the same time, you've got to make sure that it's high quality and engaging and people are going to stick with you and you're going to stick with it as well. So that is my favorite format at the minute, as I mentioned, because I do a lot of running and commuting and walking, so I can take it with me anywhere. Um, but I will find out about that usually through social media uh, rather than actually searching on, online. So that goes to show how important it is to have a decent uh, social media and influencer program up and running. Um, what was the other part of the question, sorry? I think you've kind of answered it, to be honest. Uh, okay. It was just about what, what your favourite one was. Or, or maybe, maybe, uh, looking ahead, you said infographics three years ago were your favourite. Right now, you're a podcast guy. Is there another form of getting content across that may be sneaking up that you'll be talking about in three years' time? Um, I mean, well, the thing is, with video, it's always going to be ever-present. And I think that we need to... The question now, short-form video uh, is so important. Um, if you see the sort of rise of, say, TikTok, for example, as a social channel amongst particularly younger demographics, it's very selfie-oriented um, stuff. And I think we see this on LinkedIn amongst professionals as well. A lot of people are doing uh, selfie-type videos. They're just doing sort of like monologues to camera. Um, and I, companies need to make sure that they've got a video strategy. It's almost like video. If you haven't got it, it's like a conspicuous absence. So I definitely say, look how you can make short form video uh, an integral part of your your marketing. Not just like from a brand point of view, but also from the people representing your brand. So how can your sales team use them? Uh, if they're on a stand, for example, like yeah, we're at you know this particular event in London today. Make sure you swing by stand 38 to you know see what we're up to. All that sort of thing. Just short form video as well. Big big that's a big drive on that. That's something we all have to think of, uh, I suppose. Um, well, I think that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you again, Chris, for presenting no the webinar. Um, thank you for all who attended today. Apologies for the technical details we have there. I'd like to say once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you could provide any and all feedback so we can keep providing you with the content you want and require. As a, refer a further reminder today, uh, all of our member-exclusive webinars are CPD eligible for chartered professional development. By submitting your CPD record, you not only keep your learning and development on track, but you could also achieve our chartered marketer status. Uh, you can find out more at MyCIM or get in touch with our membership team today. 
on behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank Chris again for presenting the webinar, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone, and I look forward to those who are coming on the 12th.